Hi, my name is Todd Whitehead, and I'm, from the, I'm a postdoc from the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health. And I work in the Center for Integrative Research on Childhood Leukemia and the Environment. In this brief presentation, I'd like to talk to you about measuring contaminants in dust. Um, so what's the rationale for measuring contaminants in dust? Well, as part of our center, uh, we aim to identify environmental risk factors for childhood leukemia. And we assess environmental um, exposures for children in many different ways. And you can see on the chart here, there's a couple of different uh, representations of how we assess exposure to children. So we use air samples. Uh, we also do biomonitoring by measuring chemicals in uh, blood and urine and other biospecimens. And then we do some stuff with questionnaires where we ask about smoking habits or pesticide use. But what I want to talk about today is our dust sampling. Uh, so we collect dust samples and we analyze them for persistent chemicals. And we've done that for uh, several hundred homes in our study. Now, the way the dust collection works is essentially, uh, we, we've tried it a couple different ways, but what we're thinking is the most efficient way for our study is to actually have the residents take out their own vacuum bag. So, you know, you just open up the vacuum and you take out the bag, and then they mail the bags to, to our study center in prepaid parcels. And when they get to the lab, we tear them open, and we're left with this uh, chunk of you know, well, you've seen it before, it's like a hairball with dust embedded into it, and you kind of have to tear it apart in order to get something out of it. And what we do is we sieve it, so we put it in these sieves, and it looks like this at first. There's papers and, and gum wrappers and rubber bands in there. Um, and what we do is we uh, take those sieves with the coarse dust and the debris, and we shake them up using a, a mechanical sieve shaker, and it knocks the sieves, ar sieves around, and it shakes them around. Uh, and what you do is you separate the debris from the fine dust. And what you're left with is here on the right uh, a nice homogeneous dust sample that's suitable for our dust preparation, our sample preparation. Uh, now, the strengths of this sort of approach are that, first and foremost, it's really uh, easy for us to collect the dust in that way, and it's inexpensive. So we don't have to worry about sending an uh, interviewer to someone's home. Uh, and setting up visits, uh, paying for travel. We just have the uh, residents themselves collect the dust for us, really. Um, we can measure many persistent chemicals in a dust sample like this. We can measure flame retardants, pesticides, um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Anything that's persistent will accumulate in the dust, so we can measure that effectively. Uh, it will indicate to us, these dust measurements will indicate to us the average level of contamination in a home over a long period of time. And that could be something that's very useful for a study like ours, uh, where we do retrospective exposure assessment, which is to say that we uh, try to figure out what the children are exposed to uh, after they've already been exposed to, to it. Uh, and, and the final advantage is that uh, some dust measurements uh, are highly correlated with the total chemical intake, um, which is assessed by using a biological measurement. So for example, I'm showing here a plot that compares uh, BDE-47, which is a flame retardant, in dust measurements from 40 homes with BD-47, the same flame retardant, uh, in maternal plasma in the blood. So we're comparing what we're measuring in the dust to what we can find in mother's bodies. And we're, we're seeing here that when there's a low level in the dust, there's also a pretty low level in the mom's body. And when there's a high level in the dust, there's a pretty high level in the mom's body. So this just indicates that what we measure in the dust can be an effective marker of what people are exposed to in their total chemical intake. Now, the limitations to this sort of strategy are that uh, although sometimes dust measurements for certain chemicals can be indicative of total chemical exposure, they're not equivalent with total chemical exposure. So you're going to miss out on some other routes of exposure shown here in the plot. So for example, we're not going to know anything about what people are eating or what they're breathing based on what's in the dust. Um, now, for this particular chemical, again, it's a polybrominated diphenyl ether, and for this particular population, toddlers, young children, we see that dust is, in fact, a very important route of exposure. Um, but diet is also important for toddlers. Um, and for other chemicals and in other populations, these other sources of exposure to chemicals, diet and air, air or, or inhalation, uh, are more important than for PBDs and, and toddlers. Now, another limitation is that when you use a vacuum dust sample, you don't necessarily know specifically where and at what time the dust was collected. Because 
if the residents are just using the vacuum cleaners how they usually use them, they're going to be using them in all sorts of different rooms um, at times where they're not necessarily recording it or thinking about it. Um, so it's hard to really assess exactly where the dust came from and, and when it was collected. Um, and this makes it difficult to assess um, at a very specific point in time what sort of chemical contamination might have been in a home. Um, so again, you're going to get sort of an average over a long period of time and in many different rooms. Um, and you're not going to know necessarily about a specific location or a specific time in the history. Um, but despite these limitations, we think that uh, in our study, using dust to assess children's exposure to persistent chemicals is a useful strategy. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our funding sources, which are the NIHS, the EPA, and the NCI. And I'd also like to acknowledge my collaborators from the California Child of Leukemia Study, the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and the California Department of Public Health. Thank you very much for listening.